Greetings and welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogulov from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. And I'm super pleased and honored to welcome Femi Okandeli, who is now our Associate Vice Chancellor. It's a long title, I gotta read it. Our Associate <laughs> Vice Chancellor of Enrollment Management and Dean of Undergraduate Admissions. Back for his second appearance on Campus Conversations. Femi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me again, Dan. It's great to see you. Yeah, so now you're part of the Welcome the Dean series. And I see when you first, when you started in 2019, you were nothing but an assistant vice chancellor and director <laughs> of undergraduate admissions. And now you're an associate vice chancellor of enrollment management and the dean of undergraduate admissions. So seriously, what was behind the title change? What's happened and what's the significance of all that? Yeah, I appreciate that. I think really um, the the change in in not just the title, but the, the portfolio of enrollment from, from just admissions is recognizing that enrollment is is more than just thinking about admitting students. It, it's about um, not just bringing students into the institution, but also ensuring that students are uh, persisting and, and thriving once they once they get here. Um, big pieces of that are the, the, the pieces of the portfolio that were added. And so that includes um, working with the registrar's office. It also includes making sure that there's really strong and close ties to our financial aid um, colleagues, as well as really bringing in the Center for Educational Partnerships, which is a really dynamic um, and, and, and strong division that does a really great job of working with students out in the field um, to ensure that they are college ready, Berkeley ready. Um, and so that's really the expansion of the portfolio um, as we're seeing it uh, moving forward. Very cool. And my excitement about your new title, I forgot to let everybody know that we'd be more than happy to take your questions as we go along. You can post them to our Facebook Live site where this event is being, being streamed in addition to the YouTube site. So again, please, if you have questions for Femi, um, come visit us at Facebook at the Facebook Live site and post your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. So Femi, before we sort of dive a little bit into on the road you've traveled so far and what your plans and aspirations um, are for the future, remind everybody a little bit how you got here, just your background, um, where you were prior to coming to Berkeley and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah, so I've spent the last 15 years in um, admissions at a variety of different institutions. I began my career in upstate New York at a small liberal arts institution, um, Ithaca College. Um, and from there, I've had a chance to work uh, at the University of Delaware, Cornell University's College of Engineering. And then prior to my time here, I was at Stanford University um, uh, as an assistant dean of diversity outreach. In all of the spaces that I've been in, uh, my background has been specifically um, uh, thinking about underserved and underrepresented populations. Um, and I think that the time that I had uh, specifically in the Ivies and the Ivy Plus institutions made me really appreciate what highly selective and highly um, uh, competitive admissions cycles and processes should look like while still remaining committed to um, equitable practices and, and ensuring that all students um, are able to show different versions of excellence to allow them to emerge in our competitive pool. So two questions. First, I'm just curious, what got you interested? What pulled you into this particular field and what's kept you in this particular field all these years? Yeah, to be honest with you, what, what really pulled me into admissions was the, was the thought of working at an institution at the time when I was graduating from undergrad, working at an institution and thinking about um, the ability to pursue uh, higher, le higher levels of education. And so at Ithaca College is also where I received uh, my master's degree. And so that's what kind of got me into the space. Um, what has kept me there has really been recognizing the impact of the work that we have um, and the work that we do in, in admissions. And, and it's not just you know, evaluating applications. It's really going out into communities and talking with students about their future. Um, also talking with parents and, and, and counselors about students' options and breaking down some of the, the myths or the misconceptions that students might have of institutions, whether they belong there um, and whether or not they can thrive there. What I've learned, I think, um, since being in the field is that those conversations do not just exist directly with the students, but it, it is really important that we have those conversations with parents and with, uh, with um, uh, counselors, as well as with faculty on the campuses, right? And, and, and letting them know that the students that we are bringing in are truly excellent in, in all ways. Um, and that uh, once they get here, it really is our duty as an institution to ensure that those students are able to succeed, thrive and excel. So I wanna pick up on something you, you mentioned early on. So what do you think, what are the characteristics, qualities and values that 
we want to look for in an admissions and an enrollment process at any given university that, that what, what's the gold standard in your mind in terms of characteristics, qualities, and values of that process? Yeah, I think I think the, the, the first piece is recognizing the importance of excellence in all of its forms and making sure that you have a process that allows um, different versions of excellence to emerge. As an institution, obviously that, that begins with academic excellence. And so, so making sure that we're able to understand um, uh, what, that, what that looks like. I think more importantly, when it comes to admissions in particular, the importance of recognizing that the average um, educational experience in the US is not standard. And, and, mm. and there is a lot of nuance to that. And so mm. making sure that you have processes and policies that are able to address those nuances are really, really important. I, I think too often uh, our profession kind of gets broken down um, to, or, or really boiled down to this notion of like, you know, just take all of the students with straight A's or take all the students that have the highest test scores. And while those are really important markers, um, there, there's a reason why not everybody has um, straight A's and, and there, there's no, and it's important that we recognize that we're building communities of students once they get here, communities of scholars. And so, so ensuring that students that might not have the opportunity, for example, to take an abundance of AP courses or dual enrollment college courses because their high schools don't offer that, still have the opportunity to emerge in our process, I think is critically important. I think the second piece in regards to creating a, a, a process um, uh, or a portfolio that, that addresses uh, really the nuanced and dynamic uh, students and, and populations that we see is ensuring that we're thinking about students um, beyond just a, a, a mark or, or a grade or a score. Um, the, these are not just scores walking around our campuses, they're students, they're people. And so how, how did their lives impact who they are when they're approaching our college application process and who they're going to be and how they're gonna to contribute to our scholarly environment is another piece that must be embedded in the um, admissions process. Then I think once students get here, it's really about do we have all the resources necessary to ensure that these students are going to succeed. That includes financial resources, um, but that also includes all of the other pieces to ensure that students aren't just graduating um, uh, from, from your institution, but they're taking advantage of all of the uh, opportunities um, that your institution are able to provide. And so um, that, that means making sure that students are plugged in to advisors and um, internship opportunities, research opportunities and the like. Um, and then also serving as a, as a place where students can really grow and expand um, their mind, their knowledge and their perspectives. Um, all of that I think is critical um, in, in making sure that your enrollment unit is strong. And I think that some of that is created within that unit and some of that is really plugging students in to already existing units um, that, that might exist on a college campus. And so uh, when I think about what our work is, sometimes our work will be to create some dynamic interventions. Sometimes our work will be to promote some dynamic interventions that are already taking place across campus. Um, and sometimes it might be calling out um, practices that are not working in alignment with our mission um, or might have disparate impacts on populations that have been unseen in the past. So a beautiful description of the gold standard. So share with us some of the steps that you've led, things that have happened, changed since you arrived that are moving us down that road towards that gold standard. Yeah, and so I think I think to begin with, it really was, and the last time that we spoke, I, I talked to you a little bit about some of the changes um, that we were making in admissions around um, moving us to a territory model and allowing us to be able to understand um, the academic context in which students are coming from. We've been we've been really working hard to sharpen that and to strengthen that. And I think I think similar to a lot of really strong um, um, admissions offices, I, I think it's important to know that we don't simply arrive. Um, at the gold standard that you're kind of describing it, is that it's something that you evolve into and you continue mm. to evolve as we're addressing the changing demographics and the changing landscape. And so since, I, since I've started um, uh, at, at Berkeley, a couple of things that, that I've done to really ensure um, that we're thinking about that is uh, the, the first thing that I did was I created a, an associate director of diversity outreach. His name is um, uh, Trey Moore. He, served, he sits on our leadership team. I mean, we created a diversity team that specifically looks at different populations uh, that we are interested in serving and, and recruiting. Um, and so that really was important for us to really showcase that um, diversity is not something that is additive or ad hoc, but it truly is centered in the work uh, that we do. We also decided to change a lot of our language in, in how we speak to students and, and not just that we are, um, you know, that students are lucky to get into Berkeley, but we as an institution are lucky to have these students um, on our campus and, and, and we are incredibly excited about what they're gonna contribute 
um, once they get here. Uh, once we kind of got into to COVID, um, there's a lot of different changes uh, that we had to make. And I think that COVID was an experience that really um, showed nationally what institutions valued because it required us to kind of boil things down to what is the most salient and most important in, in, this, in this environment. What I would say for us in admissions is that it was clear uh, that we really did center a lot of our work around excellence and access. And so uh, through that, we took advantage of, of the, uh, the digital space to be able to do outreach in places that we've never done outreach before. And that was both domestically and internationally. Um, we also took advantage of the fact that we would not stop connecting with uh, counselors. And so we pulled off tons of counselor programming um, again, that perhaps we would not have been able to do and perhaps counselors might not have been able to attend if we had the physical limitations um, that we typically do. Um, and so we've been really committed and, and I think we dared to ask ourselves, what would it mean uh, instead of having diversity being something that is additive or ad hoc, what would it mean to actually center the entire operation around diversity so that way it is the thing that drives us. And I think through that it has allowed us to be more considerate of the diversity of the applicant pool um, that we've been seeing. Um, and we saw that in the increase in applications uh, this past uh, fall. And we're, we're encouraged and we're hopeful that uh, students will choose us um, as they're you know, making their college choices in the next couple of days here. Yeah, so you just touched on a number of subjects. We're gonna be diving deeper into the sort of explosion or this crazy increase in applications that we've seen in certain other universities around the country. Um, the impact of COVID and so on. Before we go on though, I just wanna remind everybody, um, we're with Femi Okandeli um, and we're talking about admissions and enrollment. And if you have questions for Femi, we'd love to get them. They can be posted on our Facebook Live site where this event is being streamed. So you mentioned the word diversity a number of times. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a word that gets used a lot in different contexts. It's become politicized. What's the central argument for it? Um, I mean, it's, it's a value we all nod to, and it's one I think that we all see as important, but I'm interested from your perspective, why is it so important for a university like UC Berkeley? Yeah, I appreciate that. I think, I think it's a twofold. I think the, the first is the academic argument that, that shows and the research suggests that more diverse environments um, that also promote collaboration and inclusion um, allow for more diverse uh, um, uh, frames of thought, uh, allow for innovation, allow for creativity. And, and that is incredibly important for an institution like this. That is a research one institution that is looking to really address many societal concerns, whether they are, whether that is disease or voting rights or what have you. So I think having diversity from that perspective is critically important to lift a lot of the narratives that would be necessary to, to create uh, systemic change that our society needs. I think that the second piece is, is really recognizing that as a public institution, our job is to serve uh, the state that, 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 uh, that we are in. And, and I think that when you look at California, it's an incredibly diverse state. Um, and I'm not just talking about ethnically diverse, I'm talking about socioeconomically diverse um, as well. And, and I think that we should be um, act, actively moving towards um, representing that state um, that, that, we, that we are in. And, and while our numbers are moving in that direction, I think that there's definitely still work to be done. Um, and I think that if, in order for us to call ourselves an excellent representation of the state, we truly do need to represent that um, in our student body, as well as in our faculty uh, and, and staff as well. So I'm curious, last year we admitted um, what we described as our most diverse class in many, many years. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about the class to come? I think the class to come is, is one that I am excited about. As I mentioned to you uh, before, we did a lot of really strong outreach in this past year. Um, I also know, and I'm sure that you'll ask me about the, the change in our standardized testing, um, but, but by and large, what I'm excited about is the fact that um, we, we put in the work um, in our outreach and in our messaging to really go after students and let them know that we are seeking, we are seeking them. We did a lot of really great work in regards to native recruitment that I'm excited about. And I'm hoping that we'll yield the fruit that, that we're asking for. Uh, and then also um, when it came to our African-American initiative, we did a lot of really strong work there connecting with uh, school districts and, and uh, all across the state. Uh, we, in regards to the HSI work, we've been actively pursuing that. Um, as well, signing national partnerships with the National Hispanic Institute and more. And so we've really been 
committed to moving the needle and moving this work uh, forward. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping as, as you know, uh, again, we're actively, it's still in the class, May 1st is tomorrow. And so students do still have the opportunity uh, to deposit, but I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of that work is gonna bear its fruit similar to what it did um, last year, but we'll, we'll, we'll need to wait and see. Um, you know, the COVID impact on students and families is a real one. Um, it is made kind of projecting what this yield cycle is going to look like a little bit more difficult. Uh, but I'll also say that this yield cycle, we were able to approach it with much more intentionality than even last year. If you remember, um, as we were going into yield, it was, it was literally, I think, three weeks before Cal Day that we all kind of went home and, you know, for infinity. Um, and so, <laughs> and so now, uh, you know, stepping into this year, we had better digital tools this year than we had last year. Mm. Um, our yield season was much longer this year mm. than it was last year. Um, the campus also has been incredibly supportive. Our campus partners, Bridges, um, our alumni, uh, they've been actively engaged in participating in these digital formats. And we, again, continue to try to push the boundaries there. So we, we had a drive-in program, the, the only of its kind across the UC. We've also been having drive-by programs all across the state. Again, trying to kind of let people know that we, are, we see you and we, we are actively looking for you and hope that you will join us in the fall. So... Everybody in my position always loves a guest who in their answers tells them the next question they should ask, which you just <laughs> did. <laughs> and that's about the increase in applications. I believe 28% increase in applications, which is probably the largest year over year jump ever. Yeah. Many have speculated, we're gonna make this a two part question. Many are speculating or believing this has to do with the elimination of SAT scores as a requirement. What do you think? What's going on here? And what has been, do you think, the impact of eliminating the SAT? I think that eliminating the SAT is a cause for the increase in applications. I don't think it's the sole cause for the increase in applications. Uh, again, like we, this year didn't just happen, even within the last, you know, th that application increase didn't happen just over the summer. We've been actively engaged mm -hmm. with getting in front of communities really since I got here. Um, to let them know that Berkeley is, is on, a, on a very strong and particular path to, to increase uh, representation across, across the state. Um, I, I think that the, the SAT, the removal of the SAT in our evaluation process um, really did not have as much of an effect as I think that people might believe. Um, as a holistic, as we participate in holistic review, standardized testing was never really the anchor to our evaluation process. And Wait a sec, it's sorry. hard for folks to so, believe, but it's true. So are you saying that it's been a myth that it was just a numbers game about getting into Berkeley? What does yes, that mean? It, that, yes, it has definitely been a myth. I think that um, too often people believe that the reason why they got into Berkeley was their SAT score. Um, and that's, that's never been the case, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. There's a lot of students with incredibly strong SAT scores um, that are not admitted. Uh, to Berkeley every single year. And so just having a strong SAT score has never been the crux of someone's evaluation. It's really that in combination with, you know, more so your high school uh, record, because that's four years of, of, uh, of you showing your academic um, excellence and performance, as well as all the holistic characteristics that we're considering um, when students are, are applying to our institution. And again, it's not us bringing in just uh, you know, a spreadsheet of numbers, you know, a cross section of GPAs and SATs, but we are, we're building communities, diverse students, diverse academic interests. We offer a lot of really strong academics in, in a variety of different spaces. And so students' interest in those pieces are also an important piece um, to our evaluation. And so the SAT, I think, um, the, the, the removal of the SAT and its impact on and I will say this not just for, for Berkeley, but for many of these institutions that are holistic, um, has, has probably been a little bit overblown, I, I, I think, to be honest with you. I think many, many institutions, while we definitely need, need to make um, some adjustments, uh, we did not need to make a complete overhaul of our admissions process mm -hmm. this year just because we didn't have standardized testing. So what's behind the 28% jump at Berkeley? What's driving it, do you think? Hard work. To be honest with you, I would say I, I would say it's wow. a lot of hard work, and and I would say it's a lot of um, you know strong messaging and, and being out there again, pounding the pavement and letting people know that we're we're interested. Um, and and what I'm hoping is that we'll continue to see. And and I'm not saying that I'm advocating for more more applications every single year, um, but but I'm, I'm hoping that people are really starting to understand that we are changing 
um, uh, you know, who, who we've been in, in the past. And, and we're also facing institutional demons. Uh, and when I say that, I'm talking specifically about meeting the skepticism that we have met from certain communities and meeting that head on and addressing it. And, and, and it's important for, for folks to know, um, uh, for me at least, that I, I recognize that the diversity numbers at, at Berkeley are not what many people um, would like them to be. And there's a, a ton of historical reasons for that. And while, those are, while that history is important, I am much more focused on who we are becoming. I think admissions always sits at the intersection mm. of who we are and who we aspire to be. And it's really important that we keep our focus on who we aspire to be moving forward. So uh, uh, we're going to circle back because I want to hear, I want to talk more about what, where that skepticism come from, comes from and what the headwinds are that you and your team face when it comes to building a more diverse student population. Um, but I want to go back to the enrollment increase. Is there not a danger sure. that we could be victims of our own success? Meaning we have 28%, we have even more applicants, which means mm -hmm. the acceptance rate is going to be even lower, which could mean that it's going to look like it's even hard, more impossible than ever to get into Berkeley and therefore sort of perhaps weakening the bonds we have with the public. Are you concerned about that? I am concerned about that, which is why I think that an increase in applications is never our goal. Um, even as we are looking to increase, you know, the representation of different populations, increasing our applications is not something that that's necessary um, for us in order to reach our goals. It's really changing the composition of our applications that will allow us to get there. And so, so I, I, I do agree with you there. I'll also say, I'll also say one of the reasons why I think the enrollment portfolio was so important and so timely. Um, this year is while many of us, uh, you know, many across the country uh, were celebrating the, the diversity of the class and, and, and all of that. And we were excited about that. We also faced a really strong reality when we returned um, to our virtual environment in the fall with a lot of students who, just, who chose not to return um, to Berkeley. And, and so when we take a look at the overall enrollment picture, uh, there, there were, there were some, some real causes of concern uh, there with students not returning um, both in the fall and then not returning in the spring. And so I think, again, when we think about uh, enrollment as a whole, it's not just taking a look at what's coming in, but how are people making their way through the pipeline? And I'm excited to give that some more attention, I think, moving forward as we have a, all these other types of enrollment goals. Got it. Um, what are, it, among your set of peers across the country, people involved in admissions and enrollment, what, what's the com what are the conversations and speculations like insofar as possible lasting impact of COVID on university enrollment. What, what do you guys talk about? What are you thinking? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of pieces. And I think it's important to note that COVID really um, highlighted issues that already existed, but perhaps mm -hmm. were able to kind of be pushed off um, into the margins of our processes. And, and so uh, to begin with, the, the whole concept of outreach, as I kind of mentioned, um, to you before, uh, we were able to do some really dynamic things in digital spaces that we're likely going to continue. And, and a really great example of that for it would be what we were able to do internationally um, in our recruitment. Our ability to go to countries hmm. or to go to secondary cities or leave the capital of certain countries was strengthened because we were able to do um, some digital um, work and digital engagement and people responded. And I think that that is something that we will absolutely um, continue. Uh, COVID also showcased the digital divide, right? And the digital divide is, is really, um, for those who, who might be unaware, the digital divide is, is looking at those who have access to things like Wi-Fi and internet um, and even quiet workspaces at home um, versus those who, who don't. And, and I think it was, it was clear that while everybody immediately thought that we could just transfer everything online, um, there hadn't really been a consideration of the fact that people at home might not have the same or equal or equitable types of working environments as their peers. And so, uh, so COVID really brought out some of that. And I think it really brought out some of the best in our faculty in, their, in regards to their desire and need to, to, to address that, um, to be able to still offer the quality instruction um, that they were able to offer. I think as, in regards to enrollment nationally and, and what, that, what that has done, uh, you know, so, so the University of California uh, suspended um, testing as an admissions requirement. Many other institutions did the same. Uh, we, we saw the Ivies even go, you know, test optional um, for, for, for many of their, their institutions. And so I, I think that 
what that also showcased was that admissions offices can, in fact, bring in strong and dynamic classes without relying on the standardized testing um, that perhaps they had in the past. And, and, I, and I say that to say, um, you know, standardized testing, the SAT for, for all that it's worth, I think uh, has allowed some of us to create um, shortcuts in regards to how we are evaluating um, students, right? You can say, well, what was their SAT score and, and kind of decide whether or not a student is, is, is um, admissible to your institution. Without that score, it's required us to really do a much deeper dive into that student and where they are coming from because we don't just have kind of a broad um, instrument to, to make, make cutoffs or decisions. And so I like that, I appreciate that. I think that's important. Um, and, I, and I think it's really gonna do uh, a service and, and bring justice, I think, to some of the admissions um, uh, processes that we're gonna see nationally because it's gonna require more holistic review um, and a deeper understanding of the academic environments in which these students are coming from. Which in turn suggests that the relative importance of high school grades is only going to increase. And is there concern about, you know, pressure on high school teachers in terms of grade inflation or disparities of grades? What, what's the discussion like about all that now that SAT is going by the wayside? Yeah, so the grade inflation, um, you know, that, that's always been an, uh, you know, an argument that I've heard um, in response to, you know, deciding to get, to get rid of the SAT. And I, I, I think that the best way to understand, or at least for me, the best way that I am, that, that I am pursuing the grade inflation piece is, is recognizing two things. One, where does grade inflation happen? Oftentimes we see great inflation is happening in more affluent environments than it is in low income um, mm -hmm. spaces. And, and, and also understanding that the territory model is critically important to being able to address um, things like that. And so, so what, I say, what I say to that is when we are considering students, not just in their, um, not, not just the student and what they've taken, but when we're able to look at them in the context of the high schools that they're coming from, that student is being, if that student is in a grade inflated environment, they're still being considered amongst other students within that grade inflated mm. environment. Mm. And so that, that means that they still are going to need to stand out in order to be able to emerge in our pool. Same thing for students who come from environments that might not have, as I mentioned before, the, the AP um, classes, or, or the, um, uh, the dual enrollment college courses, the importance of our ability to recognize excellence within that space is still important. It's all about how many standard deviations away from the mean is a student from what is average in their, mm. in their environment and in their context. And when we're able to do that, that's when we're able to see excellence in all of its forms. And that's when we're able to really create the dynamic types of student bodies that we're looking to create here. Great, beautiful. Um, let's circle back to the issue of skepticism. Um, and I'm assuming what you meant that there's a skepticism among in communities of color, black respective students, Chicanx, Latinx, native, number of other groups, um, that Berkeley is not a difficult place um, and the climate isn't good and it, we're, we're gonna be isolated. And what's changed? Am I right in sort of that supposition and how are we addressing it if I am? Yeah, yes, I, I think you, you are right in, in that. That is, that is some of the skepticism um, that I've heard. I've also heard, you know, skepticism of, you know, students uh, from, from, you know, counselors and things like that, that describe, you know, students that I serve are not admitted to, to places like, like Berkeley. And, 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 I, and I appreciate that because I think it showcases a little bit of, you know, what have we historically done in these communities and why should they trust us? Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to, again, when we talk about, bringing people here that that requires trust not just of the student themselves but of the gatekeepers of those students we recognize that the college decision is not an individual decision mm. it is still a dinner table conversation mm. um, and so we need to make sure that we're not just recruiting the student but we're, we're recruiting the parents we're recruiting mm. the the counselors we're recruiting the teachers in those schools that that let them know that not only are we seeking their students um, but we're there to really serve them. And it's more than just representation, right? It's not just, we're looking to increase the number of diverse students on our campus, but really making sure that they are served um, once they get here. And so that is the type of skepticism um, that, that, that I've really been trying to address. And then in regards to the campus climate um, for students of color on this campus, that's, that's the other thing that I think I'm really um, excited about when it comes to what I've been witnessing really since I have joined uh, joined campus. And, and that is the continued evolution of the campus-wide understanding of why diversity is important and why it matters. 
as well as not just diversity, but inclusion in particular and belonging. And the, it's important that people understand the difference between the two, right? And so I, I tell people all of the time, if we're trying to become a Hispanic serving institution, or if we're trying to you know, really work the African American initiative to serve students, it's not just gonna be about making sure that the, the numbers are there, but it's about making sure that their experiences um, are, are ones that are, that are desired, right? And, and they're, they're ones that showcase how we are able to support students once we get here. I've had a chance to sit on the HSI task force here um, on campus. And, and I sat on that um, with uh, uh, VC, the Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion, Oscar Duvon, um, as well as uh, Professor Chris Gutierrez and a ton of really great professionals from across campus. And it's, and it's great to know that the, that the concept and the thoughts and the, the passion for, for this work is not isolated to a specific unit or division, but it really is um, all over the place. And in that, there's a reality and a reckoning that is happening that says the way in which we have served students before cannot be the way in which we want to serve students moving forward. There's been momentum that's been building over time. Um, some of that I think needs to have its story told a little bit better and, and make sure that their narratives are out there so students know that these initiatives and these, these experiences are there for them. And some of them, uh, you know, so, some other pieces of the work simply just need to be um, you know, uh, funded uh, better and, and, and fortified and, and codified in ways that allow us to, to make the greatest amount uh, of impact moving forward. And, and I know from having my conversations with, with the chancellor and the provost and, and the, the chair of the faculty senate that there truly is an interest in moving this work um, forward. And I think what I can appreciate in particular, and, and this is something that I share, is that there's also an impatience around it. People are looking to make change right now and they're looking to address this now and not you know, 20 years from now or, or, or even 10 years from now, but how are we going to make, make these changes lasting and, and, and fruitful and how are we going to make them in the immediate? And I think that that's important for our students uh, that we are currently serving and for the students who might be looking to Berkeley in the future. Got it. Let, let's stick with HSI for a little bit. And for those of you who may not know or may have forgotten, HSI is a, um, it's a status for an institution, Hispanic serving institution. And why don't, for people who this may be the first time they're hearing that phrase, Femi, tell us a little bit about what it takes to become an HSI, when we anticipate reaching or meeting those criteria and why it's so important. Yeah, so, so in order to re um, reach HSI status, that means 25% of your overall enrollment um, are Latinx identifying students. Right, and so um, for us, that means that we need to really move that needle. Um, I believe the where last. Where are we time now? To, we're, sorry to interrupt. Yep. Where are we right now? The last time I checked, I believe our overall enrollment was closer to around seventeen percent um, Latinx students, and so there's definitely some some work uh, to to be done there. Um, and the reason why it's important, I think, is is two reasons. It goes back to kind of the the, the state that we're in and the population that that we look to serve. The population of California is much more than 25% Latinx. And so the ability for us to, to, to really say that we are serving the state um, should match the demographics of the state that we're in. I think that that's important. But again, more importantly, it's, it's recognizing that as the Latinx population grows, the future of America is browning. And, and, and it's important for, for folks to know that it's our job and our duty to continue to educate that group um, and ensure that they are receiving a top-notch education like this one, I would say the same, not just for HSI, or excuse me, not just for the Latinx group, but going back to the concepts of diversity and why that's important. Um, the HSI requires us all to really look at how are we serving um, marginalized, historically marginalized populations, not just the Latinx um, community. And I think through that lens, it allows all of the boats to rise, if you will, when we start talking about student service and student programming. And, and that's why I think it's, it's so critically important. I can tell you that through, through, the, through the lens of the HSI, as well as the success of the African American Initiative, that the campus's entire concept of diversity and inclusion is continuing to grow. And, and, and oftentimes when we talk, when we start talking about specific, specific groups, uh, you know, uh, that is combated with this notion of, you know, whether or not like the Asian subgroup, for example, um, uh, is, is going to be feeling some sort of impact if we are looking to increase other groups. And I think there's two pieces that I would say to that. The first is recognizing that the Asian group, the way in which it is currently defined, I don't think does justice to the fact that it is an incredibly diverse 
group. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think oftentimes people look at things like the model minority myth and they cascade those experiences on, the, on an entire subgroup that's incredibly, incredibly um, diverse, especially when you think about um, the uh, academic pursuits and the academic um, uh, uh, successes of students when you disaggregate the Asian subgroup. So if you were to take a look, for example, um, at student persistence or, uh, through high school of Chamorro, Laotian, um, Hmong students, and you compare that to Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese students, you'd see a dramatic um, uh, difference there. And what I'm excited about on our campus is that we are, we are starting to really disaggregate um, that data. There's been um, real strong work being done uh, to make sure that the Pacific Islander group is now going to be categorized under our underrepresented minority um, uh, uh, group, which is critically important, um, again, to recognize the diversity within that subset. If we really want to do justice to these, to these groups, it's, it's making sure that our data is aligned to be able to see people. And if we can see people and see, see how they are proceeding um, uh, through our processes, then we can start to create interventions that again, allow us to ensure that those students are gonna find a home and be successful once they get here. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in from people who are watching today. And, and uh, just wanna remind everyone um, that if there are additional questions you'd like to pose, you can do that through our Facebook Live site where the event is being streamed. So back to HSI and the whole diversity effort, you know, people in my position, um, we, every now and then we get questions from media, we get letters from different interest groups around the country who know of our plans to become an HSI institution, who know of our plans and intention to have a more diverse student body population who say, you cannot be doing this without breaking the law that prohibits the, you know, consideration of race in your admissions. And your response to that is what? How, how can we do that? How can we have these sort of specific increases um, or plan for increases without quotas and without violating Prop 209? So I think that there's two pieces. Uh, to, to, first to understand Prop 209 specifically, right? Prop 209 limits us in our ability to be able to evaluate students um, with characteristics attached to their evaluation. So gender, race, um, are, are some of those characteristics. And we continue to do that and we will continue to do that um, in our processes. I, I think that when it comes to anyone who says that it's impossible for us to create diversity gains at an academically excellent institution, I think is not paying attention to the academically excellent diverse students that mm. are actually out there. The pool is much bigger and broader than people understand. Um, and so, so I would say, I would say that. The second piece, as I mentioned before, is making sure that we are defining excellence in a way that allows folks um, to emerge. And, and, and the moment that we start to decide that excellence is determined by a score or by a specific course or program is the moment that we need to make sure that that specific course or program is available to everyone. Otherwise you're creating inequities in your processes, right? And so, so to me, um, I, I, would, I would reject the notion um, that says that it's, it's impossible for us to increase our diversity while still remaining um, academically excellent. I think it's just about if that's what our goals are, we, we need to be thoughtful around that. And then, and then in regards to the quota piece, I would go back to kind of where we're sitting today, right? And, and where we're sitting today is that students are deciding where they wanna go. So just because we admit students doesn't mean that they're gonna actually come here, right? And, and we are very humble in that, which is why we're so aggressive in our yield cycle. And we're really working with our entire community here to let students know that this is the place to be. The bottom line is, is that the students that get admitted to Berkeley oftentimes have many options. And so uh, we, we need to be aggressive in letting them know that this is a place um, uh, that, that we want them and that this is a place in which they can, in which they can thrive. And so we, we're gonna continue uh, to, to work, um, especially in our outreach um, and, and, and definitely on our yield on, on, and on specifically targeting and, and increasing um, our engagement of these communities. Um, and, and we're hoping that that's gonna turn into, um, you know, some stronger representation in the freshman class and, and, and classes uh, moving beyond that. But I think more importantly, when it comes to the HSI uh, um, conversation, I think it's important to recognize the most important word in Hispanic serving institution is not Hispanic, it's serving. And we need to make sure that once mm. they get here, we are truly serving them um, because if not, the students will, will, will uh, 
find other institutions that will better serve them. And then all the work that we're doing, all the fruit that we might be bearing in admissions will simply die on the vine. And that's not, that's not the work that we're trying to do. And so um, again, that's why I think the enrollment portfolio uh, is an important one in order for us to really achieve our goals. I'm definitely going to call you the next time I get a question like that from a reporter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's go to some great questions that have come in from folks who are watching today. The first one. So with, who asked, how has this tremendous increase in applications impacted your staff? And generally speaking, how has COVID impacted the work of staff, many of whom are student facing in your newly expanded portfolio? Two great questions. Yeah, it has been incredible. Uh, so uh, speaking specifically to the to the increase in applications, it was incredibly difficult, I think, um, this year um, on our staff. And, and we read all of those applications. We read every freshman application at least twice. Um, some of those applications get read a third or even a fourth time. Um, and we were committed to, to keeping all of our nuanced understanding um, center to our evaluation process. And so um, we, we also extended our reading time for about a week, which isn't much um, to, to really go through um, all those applications. And so our, our staff really were committed to reading around the clock um, for a good two and a half month period or so uh, of our applications. And, um, and I would say it was a daunting um, mountain to climb. Um, and I'm incredibly proud to say that they, they climbed that mountain and, and really got it done. I would also say what, what, what oftentimes gets overlooked when it comes to the increase in applications that yes, we saw an increase, a 28% increase in um, freshman applications. We also saw an 8% increase in transfer applications as well. Mm. And those, those also needed to be evaluated with thoughtfulness and diligence. Um, and there's a much shorter evaluation window um, for transfer students than there is uh, for freshmen. And again, our, our staff really rised, I think, to that, to that occasion. COVID as a whole, I think has been very hard on, on, on not just um, the staff that are, that are student facing, but really all of the staff. And so mm -hmm. I, I would say um, for, our, for my colleagues that exist in the Center for Educational Partnerships, I know that COVID was incredibly difficult. As I mentioned before, they're out there in the field, in high schools, really doing work. And, and as we all know, high schools kind of shut down all across, all across the state and across the country. And so that work um, became much more difficult um, to, to really get a hold of students and engage with students. We know that Zoom fatigue was a real thing um, this year. And so the ability to, to really get students around um, uh, to talk about you know, your college futures and things like that, another daunting task, um, but they were creative and they were persistent in, in, in hoping to, to really work out and, and, and reach out to students. And, and I think that we saw that um, uh, in the applications that we received on how prepared the students that are participants in the Center for Educational Partnership programs um, showed up in the application process and we were encouraged by that. I'll say that COVID as a whole, however, um, it was really difficult. And I, I just wanna take a moment, you know, uh, this summer was probably the hardest professional year of my life as, as we were doing a lot of new and dynamic things. Um, COVID has had a disparate impact on black and brown communities. It was also a summer that was wrought with um, you know, calls for racial justice and, you know, uh, calling out of police brutality. Um, and it was very hard, I think, on a lot of us to be able to have to face all of that right. in isolation. And, yeah. and, and that, uh, th there was a lot to kind of work through um, <laughs> uh, with that. And, and, and I think that as we are, as we're getting ready to return back to campus, um, and we're excited about the community, I think one of the things um, that, I, that I will be taking with me um, through this experience is the importance of taking a step back from the work and, and taking a personal, um, personal uh, uh, stock of where you are and how you're feeling before having to show up and step into the meetings. I, I think as a, as a black leader on this campus, um, I, I can't speak to, um, I, I couldn't speak to you today without talking about just how difficult it was to really show up in spaces um, and with, with everything that was kind of going on um, in the background. Again, I would say one of the things that I was the, probably the most proud of is, the, is um, we have uh, an associate director in our office, Stefan Montooth, who's also a Cal alum, and he works with our uh, yield and messaging programs, um, found it really important for the admissions office to put out a message, um, not just to prospective students, but to alums and to everyone to let them know how we felt about um, racial injustice hmm. over the summer. And we were able to get a message out there. And it's something that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, 
and again, centering our mission around those who have been um, traditionally forgotten has allowed us to really be thoughtful about everything. And, and it's not, and I should say, it's not just, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement that has been so important, but it's also the anti-Asian rhetoric and violence that we've seen. Um, the, uh, again, all of these calls around police brutality, um, the, the victimization of Black women in particular, um, has, have just been things that have really uh, hurt, I think, in this, in this space. Um, and, and I'm excited again for us to come back and join, join in community. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the COVID year was definitely a, an incredibly impactful year um, for many of us. And I, I should also say really quickly um, how grateful I have been um, to many of the white allies across campus who have been really um, committed to strengthening their understanding of marginalized communities and their experiences and have been committing themselves to being active allies um, in the fight for justice, um, not just here at Berkeley, but broadly. Yeah, wow, let that sink in here for a second. Um, more questions from the audience. Sure. Speaking of diversity, so this person wonders, was there an increase in the diversity of, of high schools that students were admitted from, meaning more students from a variety of different schools, urban, private, public, Bay Area, greater California, or is that, uh, is that sort of a steady state in terms of the blend of high schools we draw? We, no, no, we, we definitely increased, um, I believe we did increase the, um, the amount of high schools that are gonna be represented in the class. Mm -hmm. I know we increased the amount of countries that are gonna be represented um, in, the, in the freshman um, class this year uh, compared to last year. Um, and, and it's really been uh, making sure that we are finding space um, uh, and admitting you know, more of our students that are coming from the LCFF and the SAPEP schools and the Title I schools all across, all across the state. So I do think that we're gonna see a broader representation um, there. Uh, again, the question is, is you know, whether or not these students are gonna choose us. And, and, and I, I, I remain humble in that um, because again, I recognize that the students that got in here got a lot of really great and excellent choices. And so, uh, I'm hoping that that's going to come through kind of on the, on the back end as well. I, I don't know what you say. I hope students choose us. I, do you take this personally? <laughs> I, I, I don't take it personally, but I, you know, the, the, I take the work personally, right? Yeah. When, when we show up in these communities and we, we represent the institution, um, you know, we, we really are, I believe in what Berkeley does. Yeah. I believe in, in, in our mission. And I believe that, uh, a lot, a lot of communities deserve this world-class education. And, and so, you know, when I, when I say that, I really do hope that they choose us. If they choose not, if they choose to go to other places, you know, that's fine as long as it's not UCLA or Stanford, but if they, if they choose, <laughs> right? And, but if they choose to go other places, you know, that, that I, I recognize that the college fit is a real, is a real thing. Yeah. And, and yeah. we might not fit for, for all students. And so, sure. um, so uh, you know, I, I just keep that, you know, front of mind um, to say, you know, just because we admitted these students does not necessarily mean that they're going to choose us. They have options for sure. Yeah, I don't know when you said choose us. I had this picture of you sitting on against the wall at the high school dance, <laughs> hoping somebody would ask you. And so I just wondered, okay, I'm glad I'm to hear. I'm hoping we get to dance. I'm hoping yeah. we get to dance, man. That's there right. you go. <laughs> Next question. Can you please tell us how you read hundreds of thousands of essays? Um, do you outsource to alumni readers? Do you use AI? Yeah, we, we definitely do not use AI. Um, we, we read all of those applications. As I mentioned before, we read every single application twice. We do have, um, and we do hire seasonal you know, auxiliary readers um, to help us get through that Herculean effort. And we are incredibly grateful um, for them, uh, but that's really how we get it done. And, and we, we, AI is something that has been entering the admissions sphere as a whole. Um, and and many, uh, many folks believe that institutions that receive the volume of applications like ours could truly benefit from AI. I think the problem for me at least um, with AI is that I still think that admissions is a humanistic field. And I think mm -hmm. it, requires, um, uh, it requires the ability to see nuance and I, I would need to see some sort of AI that is able to really detect nuance in a specific way as well as adhere to what our priorities look like mm. before I could commit to anything um, like that in our process. And I just haven't seen that 
Um, and so it's it's not something that I've been really entertaining or, or even looking for to inject into our process. Got it. You know, your answer reminded me of a question I forgot to ask. How many applications did we get this year for how many open slots? And so, yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I don't have the numbers specifically in front of me. I want to say we received about 120,000 wow. um, applications um, this year. Our freshman class um, is typically around 6,500 uh, wow. slots. And so, so yeah, it's, it, was a, it was a daunting task um, for sure, for sure. Um, but again, we're, we're glad that we were able to kind of get through that and work through that. Um, and I'm excited to celebrate my admission staff when we all are able to get back into person because it's a Herculean effort. Um, and, and a lot of people will celebrate, you know, um, getting into Berkeley, but there's a lot more who are disappointed. And, and we recognize that and we know that. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, do, you know, do I take it personal? I know that my admission staff, you fall in love with some of these students when you read their mm. applications and, um, and uh, you don't get to, you don't get them all. Right. And so, right. so I know that there's, there's emotion that does go into some of those evaluations and decisions. Yeah. Okay. Back to audience questions. Yeah. Do you use quotas for each high school and only compare students against their peers in the same high school? We do not have quotas for a, per, per high school at all. Um, and we do not compare students. Can you, can you give me the second half of that question? It says, and do you use the quotas, do you use quotas for each high school and only compare students against their peers in the same high school? So we do not use quotas um, for, for high schools at all, which is why you'll see that some high schools in a given year might get five kids admitted and in the next year they might get 15 kids admitted from that same high school. So it's, it's definitely not a, a quota system towards the high schools. Are students compared to other students in the high school? Not necessarily. I think that students are much more compared to what was offered to them within that high school and how do they succeed in that in that, and then there's other factors that are also contributing to, to you know, pieces of the, of the selection um, in regards to, you know, what academic majors and interests do students have versus how many slots do we have available for those specific majors and programs um, for some of those things that we have that are, that are capped, if you will, so. And that actually touches on another question right here. Do, um, and this person asked, do your comments mean that some majors have more of a chance of admission? I wouldn't say that some majors have more of a chance uh, for admission. I think that um, some, there's a variety of reasons why a major might be selective, for example. So some majors might be more selective because as we put out um, um, admits for that major, the yield on those majors is incredibly high, right? So what I mean by that is that if we need 10 students to fill up a major bucket and they, um, uh, and it has an 80% yield, we only need to admit 12 students to that major right, to, to fill that bucket. If other majors are, are competitive because they, the volume of applications that might come to that major. So it's less about the yield and it's just mm. that a lot of students apply to that major. So there's different reasons and those, those change year to year based off of the applicant pool. So because of that, quotas don't really make any sense for us and they, they, there's no real space for them um, in our processes. And it's, it's understanding that admissions really is responsive to the applicant pool that we are receiving mm. and how students are persisting um, once, they, once they get here. So, so the ability to forecast a quota just doesn't work for us because that's not how the admissions applications and files come, come in in the first place. Got it. And actually your answer touches on another question I realized I forgot in terms of numbers to ask you one thing, which is of those 120 some odd thousand students who applied, how many did we admit in order to hopefully get a yield that is commensurate with how many spaces we have? How many, are you able to say that now of those 120 plus we admitted? To be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not fully sure. And I should also say that, as I mentioned before, we're still active, active in, our, in our admissions right. process. We will take students off the wait list as well. And those will be admitted students that are currently not in account that I would even be able to give you right now because um, we'll be moving towards the wait list. In the next couple of weeks here, but we will have you know a full blown kind of release um, with all of our numbers, sure. all of our admit numbers that are that will come uh, in June. So, what was it like last year? Do you remember how many we we had? If we had a hundred thousand, some hundred thousand applicants, what we admitted of that hundred thousand? Yeah, I believe last year was around one hundred twelve thousand applications, and I want to say we admitted around fifteen thousand to bring in the sixty four hundred. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. 
Um, so a yield, so we expect a yield, it's like somewhat like 40% of what we admit. Like 45 percentish, like yeah, something like that. And is that, I don't even know, I hate to use the word normal. Is that something you see at other universities, 40% yield, higher, lower? What does that mean? Can you contextualize that number? So I'll, I'll tell you, for me, I would like that number to go up. I would, I would hmm. love for our yield numbers to be, to be stronger than, than the 40%. Um, but they are stronger than national averages. Um, and, and, and so uh, it's not necessarily a cause of concern, but it is a desire of mine for us to be able to increase yield. Because again, that means that um, you know, student, students are desiring to, 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 be, to be on our campus. Um, I, I think the yield number matters more to me than even the application number. An application just shows that a student could possibly be interested a yield indicates that this is a place that a student actually sees themselves um, on, in, you know, in the future. And so uh, that's, that's the number that I pay, I think, closer attention to than, than even applications. Okay, for, um, for this next question, we're going back to HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutions, sure. that subject. Um, and this person wants you to drill down a little bit. They ask, what exactly do we need to do to serve our Hispanic students, all students, they put in parentheses, mm -hmm. in the best way possible? I think there's a there's a lot uh, that we can do, and and I would say that that's an answer that exists um, with me and beyond me. Mm -hmm. And and I say that to say that there's there's work that needs to be done um, in the classroom in order to make sure that we're supporting students there. I think that there's work that needs to be done um, in regards to co-curricular experiences to ensure that students are are having the experiences that that are that are of the caliber of the Berkeley experience mm. that they deserve. And so, so I think there's a lot of that. I know that they are, um, that my colleagues across campus are working on a Chicanic Latinx student center. Um, and I think that that will be uh, important. I also think that, uh, or I know that we're working to diversify our faculty, right? It, you, uh, and and that's, that is critically important, not just for representation of faculty, but having, having diverse faculty at a, at a research one institution means that the research coming out of our faculty is increasingly diverse as well. And so I think that that is critically um, uh, important as well as the student representation um, that, that we're having here. And so, so I think there's a lot uh, kind of all across the board um, that needs to be looked at and, and really assessed. Um, and again, I would say that there's really strong gains in some of these areas, um, uh, but there's definitely opportunities um, for, for, for greater and stronger work and collaboration in other spaces as well. Got it. So we have time, believe it or not, for one more question. Okay. Um, it's been an amazing discussion, like the last one. So you're going to get through the admission season, take a deep breath, you made it through with your team this unprecedented, challenging year. When you're thinking about the road ahead, what are the big items on your plate? What are the things that, the changes that you still want to see happen, the goals and aspirations you have that haven't yet been met? Where are your professional ambitions for your team going to be taken? That's a great question. I think um, one of the first things that, that we are really excited to do in the admissions office in particular is really assessing what worked and didn't work in this COVID space and how is that going to change the way in which we approach admissions moving forward um, in a holistic way, right? So how are we going to continue to use um, digital tools to be able to reach out to students um, and reach out to families, um, I think, moving forward? So I think that that's, that's one of the first things that, that we want to look at. Also, what was the success of re-evaluating without standardized testing? And, and, and that's something that we are going to continue um, to look at. Um, I believe that a holistic review process is grounded in contextual understanding. And so is there better context that is out there um, uh, to help us continue to sharpen that is something that we'll continue to look at. As we look towards this enrollment piece, um, I, I think that the synergies of, of working with groups like um, uh, the Center for Educational Partnerships, uh, as well as uh, the Division of Equity and Inclusion um, are going to be really, really important when we start thinking about uh, again, not just representation, but but success when students when students get here, and and particularly first year and second year uh, persistence of students. And so I'm excited about that. I think that um, what I'm what I'm really interested in, I think, as an institution, is as we are increasing the diversity of of our institution, 
for us to do that in admissions, we had to disaggregate a lot of data. And it wasn't just um, the, the Asian subgroup. It was also really taking a look at the other indicators of a student's identity and how those play a role into some of their decision-making. And so it's not that all Latinx students just make decisions um, in a monolithic way. African-American students don't make decisions in a monolithic way. And so once students get onto our campus, how are we also giving that same credence, right? So how are we making sure that there's a broad tapestry of diversity of offerings for the Latinx community because we know that that's a we know that that's a diverse group within itself. Same thing with the African American community. Same thing with the Asian American community. Um, how are we going to continue to think about think about the holistic pieces of the student moving forward? I think is going to be um, critically important. And and I, I would say, lastly, um, one of the things that 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 is is going that is going to be important for us as an institution. And I think this is higher education. Um, as a whole, is that we have two challenges that we really need to address. The first is the cost, right? I think I think everyone who 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 exists in the space recognizes that the costs are are getting unwieldy, and 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 I just don't think um, I don't think that public education should be costing what it costs at this time. But I recognize why it does, and a lot of that has to do with you know government relations and and the lack of funding that comes from the state. But I think that that's something that needs to be addressed, and then really recognizing that if we see that there are gaps in the K through 12 space, mm. right? What is our role as a public institution and as a mm. university to step in and, 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 and do anything about what we are observing? And, and the reason why I say that is because I, I'm, I'm growing in concern around um, institutions creating benchmarks Mm. or creating um, ideas for what the what is the right um, what is the right academic experience mm. that a student needs in order to be successful on our campuses and whether or not that academic experience is broadly even available and that that to me is is a, is a real um, challenge that I would like to break down and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to understand it um, as well uh, because if I think about the entire two and through I think about you know, if we recognize that there's a lack of uh, representation, for example, in the STEM field, right? And we see that same lack of representation in the STEM majors and programs. And I'm not talking about Berkeley, I'm just talking about broadly. Why is that? And a lot of that is because those majors and programs typically have inputs that are necessary in your, in your high school curriculum that might not necessarily be broadly available. So what are we saying when we start talking about the structures that might be in, um, in the way of allowing us to get to the most equitable and diverse spaces um, that we're looking to create. So those are some of the things that I think that are worth um, challenging and, and really, um, really analyzing uh, moving forward. And I'm hopeful to be able to not just do that here at Berkeley, but to do that with colleagues across the country as well. Got it. Um, Femi, thanks so much for your uh, second appearance here on Campus Conversations. Yeah. I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I think you talked yourself into a third appearance somewhere down the road. <laughs> given all the irons you have in the fire, but really thanks for your work and uh, thanks for your, your time today. Thanks for everybody thanks, for tuning in. Just wanna remind you that coming up on May 24th at noon, we're gonna have our last conversa campus conversation of the semester with Chancellor Carol Christ and outgoing Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Paul Olivasados. We hope to see you then. And until then, be well and stay safe. Have a great weekend, thanks.